If your heart beats passionately for people who have wandered far from God, this series, Eats with Sinners, explores the characteristics of Jesus everyone desires. Right, talking about humility today. We're, we're in this study, uh, Eat with Sinners, and we're looking at Jesus's, uh, uh, the characteristics of Jesus that make him so attractional to people. And, and so uh, when we're, we're talking about humility, and uh, in, in this idea of humility, we understand that it's, it's hard for us, but considerably hard for the creator of the universe. Now, the, a definition of humility is this. Humility is the quality of having a modest view of one's importance. Uh, I like what C.S. Lewis says about humility. He says, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking uh, of yourself less. So it's not that we're putting ourselves down in a bad way. We're just thinking of others more, thinking of Christ and his kingdom more. Uh, Tim Keller says, humility is so shy that when you begin talking about it, it hides. And anytime you got to say how humble you are, we already know how humble you're not, right? I mean, that's the way humility is. Uh, Thomas Merton, uh, he says, pride makes us artificial but humility makes us real. And it's true. Uh, none of us like to be around pride-filled, braggadocious people. That, that rubs all of us the wrong way. But uh, this humility of Jesus is what made him so attractional to people. So in this series, last week we talked about integrity. This week we're talking about humility. In this series, we're looking at these characteristics in Jesus that make him so appealing to people and as we learn how he, uh, who he is, the model for every man, we begin to adopt these things in our own lives so that we too become uh, missionaries, evangelists, uh, people who are sharing the good news with people around us. There's a big sign as you walk out the double doors that says, entering the mission field. And as soon as you go out those double doors, you're going out into a mission field of people who are dying to know about the hope that we have. I mean, who else gets out of bed, trudges through the snow, drives here on Sunday morning? We're here because we want to be here. We're here because we worship the King of Kings. William Beebe was uh, a naturalist, and he was a friend. He was friend with Teddy Roosevelt, and oftentimes they would spend uh, time together at his retreat. And uh, they would go out on a starry night and just gaze at the stars. Both of them had an interest uh, in astronomy. And so they would point out different constellations, and they'd say, that's the Milky Way, and, and point to this great star. And, and then after a period of just pondering the greatness of the universe, Roosevelt would say to his friend William, I think we're small enough now. Let's go inside. And so it was, they gazed upon the stars just to get an understanding of how great God is and how small they were, he being the president of the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And, and so what we have just done is we have just worshipped the creator of the universe. We've just worshipped the one who put the stars up there and keeps them moving in their orbits. We're worshipping the king of kings. And that, that's just awesome. And, and so today, you know, as we contemplate that... This King of Kings, this Jesus Christ, would take the form of a human and dwell among us and humble himself before men. It, to me, it just blows my mind that God would, would make himself so available to, to his creation and, and make himself so, so vulnerable. And, and, and I, that not only appeals to me, I just I, I have a hard time fathoming how a creator God does that, just that fact alone. The humility of Jesus simply stuns me. Now, here's our text today. So this is Jesus entering Jerusalem. This is the final week of his life here on earth. And so let's begin reading in Luke 19. After Jesus had said this uh, parable about, uh, well, you have to go back and read that on your own. Uh, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage, Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, who are you untying it? Say, 
The Lord needs it. Don't try that on me. Those uh, who were sent ahead and found it just as the Lord had told them, they were untying the colt. Its owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks uh, on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for, they all, for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is God's word today. This is his revelation for us. And we're going to try to learn about Jesus' humility and how it uh, intersects into our own life. Now, for centuries, the church has honored this Sunday before Resurrection Sunday, before Easter Sunday, as Palm Sunday. And, And why do we do that? Well, it commemorates Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and where these branches were placed Uh, before him as he entered in, where the crowd shouted his uh, praises. And this is the Sunday prior to the Thursday of his arrest, prior to his crucifixion on Friday and his resurrection next Sunday. And so um, anyway, this is what we call the beginning of the Holy Week. Now, many of you, and if you didn't pick one of these up, I encourage you to do so. uh, Many of you picked up these crosses, and here's what we're asking you to do. As you carry this cross this week in your pocket, this is yours to keep. Uh, It was uh, uh, graciously made by a couple here in the church, uh, made all these. Uh, What we want you to do is just to uh, consider what Jesus carried to the cross for you. And uh, and what I encourage you to do is to give up something uh, this week that reminds you of the sacrifice that Jesus made. So maybe you give up Facebook. Maybe you give up television. Maybe you give up the news. Maybe you give up a meal. Maybe, maybe there's something that you give up. And as you touch this cross throughout the week in your pocket, your pocketbook or whatever, as you, as you have that as, as a reminder of what this week commemorates and what we're talking about, because this is a, it, it's a really special time for those who believe in God and believe in Jesus. And we want to share the good news with others. And so... Uh, This scripture that we just read reminds us that the king of the universe humbled himself and entered the city that would end up crucifying him on a cross. And so in ancient times, you see, when your king went off to battle and he returned victorious, the, the, the crowds of people would go outside the city gate and they would shout praises, offering uh, waving branches, laying their cloaks on the ground as the people uh, honored the uh, arrival of the victorious king. And so there's all this symbolism uh, that's found uh, in, ancient, uh, in ancient times wrapped up in this text. Now, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, some people construct it or break it down into three parts. And so what we have just read, beginning in, in Luke 19... What we have just read is the beginning of the third part. And so uh, here's how some people break it out. Uh, Chapters 1 through 8 talk about who Jesus is and his mission. And chapters 9 through 19, the first half of of chapter 19, talk about what it means to follow Jesus. That's where Jesus talks, in that section, talks a lot about the cost of discipleship and the parables that talk about that. And what we just read to the end of the book of the Gospel of Luke is about his purpose as your king. And so uh, it's so important that that we understand that Jesus has come to be king of our lives. Now, Jesus has not come to be your coach. He has not come to be your advisor. Jesus has not come to be your president. Jesus has not come to be your, you know, kindly grandfather. Jesus has come to establish himself as king. That's, that means what he says goes. That means at times we have questions about things and we're like, I don't know, but he's king. I get that. Uh, we are his servants. He is our defender. And we are subject to his authority. 
without question. That's what it means. So sometimes in our realm, we have a, a hard time in the United States understanding a king because our country started without a king, right? As a matter of fact, if you know history, they wanted a king, they wanted to make George Washington a king, and he, he refused that, and he had to adamantly refuse being made a king. And so we have a hard time with that. Now, other countries where there are kings still in existence, like the UK and stuff, they might get this a little bit, but we're in this democratic, you know, um, I kind of have my own rules in life, and I kind of have my own way of doing things, and I kind of have my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, agenda. And, and, And it's hard for us to surrender that, because that's what we do when we follow Jesus. We are surrendering all that to His kingship, to His authority. And so... As we look at this passage today, we're, it's, it's, it's almost like, really, this is the way the king of the universe entered on a cult? Well, that shows his humility. It was, it was, it was customary at that time that an animal never used before was used for such sacred and honorary, uh, honored uh, uh, events. But anyway, they all call out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, uh, I, I want you to journey with me, if you would, through the book of Luke, over this next 12 weeks as we go through the gospel of Luke. And here's just a couple apps that will help you understand what you are reading. So I like the Bible Project, I like the Read Scripture app, and the YouVersion app. If you, don't, if you have a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, and you don't have one of these Bible study apps, I encourage you to get one. And, and, and as far as the Bible Project, there are five uh, short videos that explain the gospel of Luke because we really want to elevate our spiritual maturity. It's one of our three-year initiatives, right? We're trying to elevate the spiritual maturity of the congregation. So as we go through the gospel of Luke, looking at these characteristics of Jesus, I encourage you to read the gospel of Luke over these next uh, a couple months with me and, and learn more about who this king of the universe is. So first of all, we want to declare that he is the once and future King. So if you're filling in the blanks on your bulletin, he's the once and future king. Now, if you notice when we read the passage today, or you have your Bible open, uh, when you ever you see uh, the passage indented in your Bible, that means that's a quotation from the Old Testament. And so they are quoting Psalms 118, 25 through 26. It's a proclamation of the king who's coming. And so it's, it's a hope, but it's not just a Jewish hope, it's a universal hope. All of us have this hope that there is there's a Superman coming, there's a Justice League that's going to show up, right? There's a Spider-Man that's going to... What I'm trying to say is that, that this is a universal thing. That within our own movies and our own books, there's this idea that there is a Savior King coming. And he's and, and I just watched a movie, I don't want to be a spoiler, but I just watched this movie where one of the great ones, one of these great superheroes actually comes up out of the grave. And I'm like, the, how, how do we come up with these ideas? Well, they're not original, right? They're found right in the middle of Scripture because uh, it's in the Bible that we have this idea that there's a Savior King coming who will make every wrong Right. And so um, the USA here, uh, that we, we're struggle with this idea of the king. I think that American church struggles with this idea of kingship, but it is what the Bible teaches. And as we discover today that Jesus is worthy of being made king. Now, all of us have some desire to worship something beyond ourselves. Mankind is hopelessly worship. Wherever you find a universal human need, you will find a universal satisfaction of that need. We're thirsty. There's water. We're hungry. There's food. We want to worship. Here's the king of the universe, Jesus Christ. And if we don't worship the king of the universe, we'll worship almost anything. C.S. Lewis says, where we are forbidden to honor a king, we will honor millionaires, athletes, film stars, even gangsters. For the spiritual nature, like the bodily nature, will be served. Deny it food and it will gobble poison. And it's true. If we don't worship the king of the universe, we will worship something else. And whatever you love the most is what you worship. Wherever you spend your most amount of energy, your most amount of resources, your most amount of interest, that's what your God is. And whatever we love the most 
is what we are worshiping. And, and, and so many of these gods that we worship are very cruel. So if we worship youthfulness and sexuality, eventually, you know, that all dissipates, right? Or if we worship money, it can go. Or if we worship a certain person, that person fails us. And so, so what we have to understand is that this King Jesus is the one to worship because he will not, uh, he, he will not burden you. He's not doing this to, uh, to, to, to pull something out of you. He's doing this to rescue you. And so every person worships something. They worship career, pleasure, kids, uh, being popular on social media, you know, like when they post up their picture and they get a bunch of thumbs up, they're okay. But if they're all thumbs down or nobody responds, oh, I'm broken hearted. And so there's, there's this, within our culture, there are people worshiping all kinds of things. And so if we don't serve the king of kings, we'll suffer, we'll crumble under the weight of some other Lord. Now, the Bible tells us of this once king. We are reminded of this for before their sin entered the world, there were Adam and Eve in the garden. Humanity was in the garden with the king. And that king was beautiful. That king was gracious. That king was absolute glory, absolute splendor. He was like the shining sun. And there we were worshiping the king of the universe, the creator of it all. And we walked in the evening with this king. But we lost all that when we decided that we would be our own kings and we would choose our own path and we were driven from the garden. And so right before we're ushered out, right before we're pushed out into the consequences of disobedience, there's a promise given. There's a promise that this king will return. And it's stated in Genesis 3.15 and 3.16. It's called the Proto-Evangelum or the first telling of the gospel. And it's this reminder that there will be a seed of a woman that will crush the serpent's head. And that's talking about Jesus. And so when Jesus goes up on the cross, he's injured, but he it rises from the dead and he crushes death. He crushes the serpent's head. He crushes this which injured mankind. And so... If you read the Bible, I like how uh, Tim Keller says, the Bible rustles with the message of the returning king. Like, it just, it, it's, just, it's just right there. Every time you turn a page, it, there, there, there's, there's some indicator that, that we, need, we need rescue. There's some indicator that he's coming. There's some, there's some uh, message there that, that, yes, he will come and save us. And so it's just, it's just right there, and, and we're longing for it, and we know it's buried within our heart, and we see it in all, this, uh, all the media, the stories, the movies. We, it's, it's the main story of mankind. It is the story about the return of this king. And so uh, we want to make sure that, that we understand how beautiful his arrival is. The once and future king arrives in Humility. We read uh, about him coming in on the colt, and this is a reference of a fulfillment of prophecy found in Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, uh, the foal of a donkey. And this, his very humility became a stumbling block to those looking for some, you know, uh, victor with a sword who's going to slay the Roman Empire, slave all the, slay all the enemies of the Jews, you know. It, it messed them up. But for us who are removed from that, for us who are looking back at that, we're like, this is so cool that this king of the universe, this creator of all things, would come in such a lowly position. And so if you think about it, this, when Jesus, his whole life is, is broadcasting humility, He's not born in a castle, he's born in a cave. His announcement doesn't go out to kings and presidents. His announcement goes out to lowly shepherds. Uh, we see him working with the lowest classes of people that no one else wanted to touch, and he's right there. His humility is, is everywhere in it, and it's what makes him so attractional. We want to be with that guy because we feel safe. We feel like we belong. We feel like it doesn't matter what... What inconsistencies, what sinners are not, this guy's got a, he's got a plan to help us get through it and get over it. And so uh, one, an ancient rabbi said, wherever you find the greatness of the Holy One, you will find his humility. But we must never, 
Listen, we must never see his meekness as weakness. He's a king. And he, I mean, he, when he comes back the next time, and he will, it's going to be just as he said. Every eye will see him. It'll be come in power and glory. I mean, all the world will know it. And we will understand that the second arrival will be very different than the first. And so it's very important that we understand how important it is. His humility is in, in adopting it into our own life. And so as we develop humility, we become attractional to others. People get interested in what's different about us. Now, <clears throat> the Bible says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who will humble themselves will be exalted. So like, you know, uh, in sporting events, like I'm watching the Final Four, some of you watching the games, you know, some of you are really disappointed right now. You just, you burnt your brackets already, you know, so... Anyway, uh, you know, you see a player make a good shot and, you know, chess goes out, you know. For those, for those who exalt themselves, they'll be humbled. We see it all the time. We see, you know, movie stars, you know, the, uh, these award shows where they congratulate each other over and over and over and over again. I'm like, what industry does that? You know, like you talk about how great the other person, they come up and they, I'm like, whatever. I mean, for those who exalt themselves, they'll be humbled. When we talk about how strong we are, how we told that guy just how it was, or how we put them in their place, for those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled. And you want that. Because it's the only way that you can enter into a relationship with the King of Kings. As He enters our life humble, we enter into a relationship with, that, with Him in the very same way, through humility. And so the once and future king arrives in humility and he seeks followers with humble hearts who want him as their king. And so how do you do this? Like what are the steps, right? Well, I'm not big into steps, but we see some strong indicators in the passage that we've already read today. And so the first thing is this. How do you make Jesus king of your life? Well, the first one is you worship him. Why in the world do we get together every Sunday and we sing these songs and people put hours and hours into practicing and we try to make the sound just right and the visuals just right and, and the room temperature just right because we want to make this the very best moment of your week to worship the Lord of the universe. I'm telling you, he's worth worshiping. And if you will really get serious about singing praises to him, it will change your life. If you stand there, no words, no songs, head down, not paying attention, it won't make any difference. So humble yourselves. Have you ever, during a worship service, just lifted your hands or got on your knees or just contemplated, you know, like maybe you close your eyes and you just listen to all the saints saying, and you're like, it's going to be like this in heaven. It's going to be like on, you know, this is going to be amped up a lot more, right? If you don't like loud music, don't go to heaven. But anyway, <laughs> that's a joke. There'll be earplugs at the door. And so uh, anyway, but and in your bulletins, we have signposts of outward signs of inward change. And the very first one is to love God. Love God. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about worshiping Him. And so what, what you love is what you worship. What you love is what you worship. Show me where your time spent, the greatest majority of your time. Show me where the greatest majority of your energy and money is spent, and I'll show you what you worship. So we should try to treat Jesus as the king. And so try this. If you've never done this, try this. Next Saturday night at about 9 o'clock or whenever you get ready for bed, 10 o'clock, whatever, get your clothes out for Sunday morning. Write out your tithe check. Set your clock a little bit early. Be ready. Show up on time. Right? Show up earlier on time and greet people. I know I've just stepped on a bunch of toes. I don't mean to, but what I'm trying to say is this, that if we will just like, like prepare to come in the presence of a king, you know, to like walk in and say, I'm with the king. 
and, and he's my king. And it doesn't matter what's happening in my life, he's my king. And I'm going to worship him. Woo! It will begin to change who you are. And then obey him. So in the text, when the disciples got, uh, went to get the colt, the owner said, could you imagine the owner? I'm sure he had some dream. I hope he did. But he, why are you taking my colt, dudes? And what's their response? Say it with me. The Lord needs it. I've had people walk in my office and take, take a lamp out. And I, why are you taking my lamp? The Lord needs it. <laughs> right? So don't try that on me. <laughs> it's not a cult. But anyway, uh, that's a picture of perfect obedience. Parents, all of you have had this experience. You're trying to teach your kids something. Clean your room. And they have a question. It's one word. Say it with me. Why? Why? And you don't feel like explaining it to them. And, and, and because there's no explaining necessary, but whenever we have to reduce ourselves to explaining these simple commands, it, now we're no longer on this idea of king and servant. Now we're in this agreement. Well, that makes sense to me. And sometimes we read the Bible and we see something that we object to. We're like, you know, I just don't agree with that. Like, I'm just, I, that just doesn't make sense to me. Why, God? You know, why? What we're doing is reducing the king to some type of, like, associate that uh, should have to convince us of things. That's not how you approach this relationship with God. He's king. And there are going to be things in there, stories in there that we're like, I don't get it. And we just say, but he's my king and I can trust him. And then the third thing is expect the return of the king. Expect it every day. You know, expect it. I think he's going to come back on a snow Sunday but any, or, a, or a Wednesday night. But uh, <laughs> some of the Pharisees said, teacher, rebuke your disciples because they're calling, him, you're, they're calling you the king. And, and, and so Jesus says, if they don't cry out, what? The stones will cry out. Roman, Romans 8 tells us that when he was turned away as a true king, when we turn him away as a true king, the world broke. But then he comes back and he makes, a beautiful, he makes the world beautiful and right again. And so out of the shadows comes this king the first time. But from the glories of heaven, he will return the second time. And so uh, when this king comes back, we need to be ready. We need to, we need to be expecting him to return. We need to live expectantly. Do you and I live expectantly? Are our plans so detailed out that there's not much room for a return of Jesus? Some are like, man, life is up and to the right for me, and I just don't know if I want the return right now. Like, you know, we've got beautiful kids in the house, da 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 da. But all of us have intersected or will intersect some hardship in life, some suffering in life, and we'll think about how needed the return of Jesus is. As a matter of fact, let me just say it this way. If you will humble yourselves and look at your time as the time of your king and be more involved in coaching people and helping people and trying to bring some type of awareness to a problem or some type of solution to a problem in the community or some type of solution to the problem in a person's life, you'll be overwhelmed with the need of the return of Jesus because you'll intersect lives that the only hope is the return of Jesus. You'll intersect people that are so broken by sin that you're like, you know, if they could know Jesus, they could know some peace, but ultimately it's going to take the return of the king to make it all right. But when we insulate ourselves from the suffering of humanity, when we insulate ourselves from people in need, we can say things like, well, everything's okay right now. We need to live expectantly. Humble yourself and be ready to welcome. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.